Okay, so um, just to introduce myself, uh, my name is Dan McCollum, and I will be um, asking the questions for this interview. Um, and the purpose of this interview, it belongs to the Midwest Irish Music Oral History Project, um, whose goal is to collect the music and stories of musical artists in Milwaukee and the larger Midwestern region, so that they may be shared with future generations and their influence can be truly appreciated and understood. So, um, beginning, do you want to introduce yourself behind the camera, or? Um, I'm Jeff Kazak, archivist of the Ward Irish Music Archives, I'm the videographer. All right. So, I guess we should begin with, um, can you just um, state your name for the camera? Susan Marie Nicholson. Okay. Um, and I guess for the first question, uh, what is your personal history? You know, where did you grow up? Um, could you just kind of describe your family life and everything? Well, I was born at Children's Hospital, Milwaukee, Wisconsin, and uh, lived on the south side of Milwaukee for the first two years of my life. Um, my father was an employee of the uh, U.S. Forest Service and took a job in the Upper Peninsula when I was two. And so we moved to Ironwood, Michigan. And when I was two till I was five, my father passed away early um, at 27 of uh, complications from diabetes, kidney failure. He was a, an artist for the Forest Service. He did cartoons, maps, and was very influential to me. He played guitar, was self-taught, loved the Beatles, Peter, Paul, and Mary, anything folky, and just wonderful fun for me. We loved the outdoors, and animals, stuff like that. And when he passed, my mom felt very isolated and moved back to the city to be closer to family. And um, we moved into an upper flat on South Shore Drive in Bayview. It's called Bayview now. Um, and she wanted me to get into music. And she really wanted me to play piano or cello, but as it was an upper flat, anything large was out of the question. And my grandfather, her dad, uh, Hal Callen, uh, bought me my first violin at a rummage sale for 25 bucks. But I was really tiny, so it was a three-quarter size, so it was like huge. I started lessons with a uh, sister of St. Francis at Sacred Heart of Jesus School named uh, Sister Muriel Hertel, and she rented me a quarter size violin. I had a itty bitty teeny tiny. And um, then she started me with classical training and Suzuki, which is a lot of you know working with the ear and that. And I loved it. I really loved playing. And uh, she would ask me, you know, are you reading the music? Yeah, I'm reading the music, sister. She'd take the music away, and it's a lot of ear training. So that was there. Um, I continued playing throughout high school, with class, classical music, with Music for Youth, uh, which is now MISO uh, in Milwaukee. And uh, I had another teacher, Sister Helen Svankarik, and I went to St. Mary's Academy. I went to their string ensemble, you know, that. And then after high school, you know, playing the violin wasn't so cool. So I stopped and really pursued my love of travel. I uh, lived in London for a while. I traveled in the UK and in Europe a little bit, and uh, came back and started up at the University of Wisconsin taking classes, and I worked at an art gallery there uh, on the uh, downtown called Noble Gallery, and befriended a co-worker there named Jan Ernest, and uh, we both had a lot of similarities. Her father was an artist, mine was. She had an Alaskan Malamute. I had two Alaska Malamutes, and it turns out our dogs were from the same breeder, which was really cool. She played violin, and then I was asked to play for a friend from high school's wedding, my friend Sandy. And she wanted the Canon in D. And for one violin, it's kind of lame. So I said to Jan, I said, I asked her, would you do this wedding with me? Because I don't want to play by myself, and I haven't played in years. So I had just moved into my first apartment, just being back home. We had no furniture. So we taped the score to the wall. I read it that way. And so began our friendship. And uh, she invited me to her birthday party the following March. So it's probably 1988, 89, a long time ago. And uh, she said, bring your fiddle. We'll be doing some sight reading and playing Irish tunes. And I was like, oh, immediately, sight reading? You know, that fear of you know classical reading. It's not the same. And I went and was really hooked. It was wonderful, the people who 
played Scottish music, Irish music, were so uh, exuberant and really into their heritage. And some people even weren't of Irish and Scottish descent, and they still loved it, the music. So that's kind of how the seed of Irish music was planted in my life. Nice. Yeah. Um, you actually kind of somewhat took care of the second question, which is, um, what are you doing? How do you begin? So I guess we'll just move on. Um, so what was your first memory of Irish music? Was it playing at that um, one show, or were you um, exposed to it at an earlier age? Well, I did ask when I was a kid. I asked Sister Muriel about Irish music, not specifically, but more, you know, folk, kind of a general, because I'd heard bluegrass. Everybody plays really fast, and it's really cool, and it looks like fun. Everybody wants to play fast, even now. Students, you know, it's all about what they want to, they envision as fun. Um, so she got me a book. Uh, uh, I can't even remember the title. Fiddle, Fiddle Music for Violinists. And I actually dragged it out recently. It's been really, really helpful for dances. Finding some of these old chestnuts, a lot of them are in there. But um, I think the one that I had gotten was The Devil's Dream, and I played that. I love that, and that was like my first, I mean, when I was a kid, playing this music was my first foray into Irish. And um, yeah, and, and then kind of a gap, and then when I met Jan, and I was invited to play with the Glen Gillies, mm -hmm. and playing with them, and we'd play gigs, you know? So that was kind of it, yeah. Okay. So this um, kind of goes in again. Um, so how did you, can you ex talk about a little bit about your first forays into really playing Irish music as part of the gigs and stuff? Was What was that like for you? Sharp learning curve, did it come naturally? It felt, I don't know, it just felt kind of kind of natural. Um, it felt, I don't want to say a calling, that sounds very lofty, that's not it at all. It just fun and you understood why this music was slash is so important. This is part of our our bloodlines and some of the people who are drawn to it are German and Polish and it's just this this vibrant wonderful music and I think we're the you know we're the vessels that continue to carry it um, and obviously it's going to change a little bit I think I think that's part of the folk process I'm not a purist. I can't and I don't when I'm teaching and working with people. This is the way it goes. I think there are people who are far more into studying very various styles, regions, stuff like that. It's like a linguist, I think, uh, when you focus on certain things. I tend to be more broad about my approach to it, just the, uh, I don't know, the nature of the music, the love of stuff that is so vivacious so infectious, and its connection to to dance and culture, because there is a, a huge connection there. So that's kind of more what I'm into. Um, I do have to say, one of my first experiences with the Glen Gillies that really made an impact on me was going to my first house concert at the Woodford's house on Prospect. That blew my mind. I got to see Alistair Fraser right there in their living room, and I it's funny, through the years, I realized that our dear friend, Patricia Lynch, who's you know, become our dance caller and a part of our Frogwater family, you know, she's awesome. She was at that same house concert, and I didn't even know her. I think Maria Therese was there. And just this guy who was, I think he was classically trained, but he's really into the Scottish tradition. Really hit home with me. That was huge. So. Do you remember his name by chance? Alistair Fraser. Oh, Alistair Fraser. Mm -hmm. Okay. And he's still out there working. He has a school on the West Coast and works with Natalie Haas, and he's charming and wonderful as ever. He's great. Nice. So. so you said your first band was uh, the Glen Gillies, correct? Mm -hmm. So what was your, um, can you kind of, ex kind of describe what your time with them was like? How long were you guys together? Oh, gosh. Well, 89, spring of 89 was when I went to the party for Jan's birthday, March 16th. She was born the day before St. Patrick's Day, so you never <laughs> forget that. Um, and I played with them through many incarnations. Uh, we 
gained members, lost members. I mean, we had so many amazing cast members, if you will. Uh, Phil Rebenzer played with us, Jean Schwartz Geigel, um, da -da 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 -da. Steve Worser, oh my gosh, what an amazing musician. Uh, Timothy Schmitz was one of the founding members, Jan. Um, I joined them after. And then we also had uh, uh, Angus Fallon McGregor, that was his stage name, uh, Michael Spratlin. He was from Illinois, and he could play so many instruments. He played harp with us. He played tin whistle. Um, he was an arranger, a fabulous musician, and quite a character. Um, we recorded one album with him um, called Plaid Attitude, which we recorded um, at Joe's studio on the east side of Milwaukee, uh, Victor De Lorenzo's studio. And I wish we would have done more, but uh, we lost uh, Angus early on. He had passed of complications from HIV and um, just a, a devastating blow to us and to the community. And actually through him, I digress, a memorable experience here in the community, we had friends at the Paps Theater. Uh, they were friends with Phil Proctor, who was the manager there. And he called us um, and said that the chieftains were fogged in in Memphis. Would we stall and be their opener? I mean, the chieftains don't need an opener. They don't need that at all. And we said, yes, we're out the door. I mean, this was back in the day when we wore kilts, little costumes. And Angus got a call right as we, he was dashing out the door. They said, don't worry, they just landed at Mitchell. We're fine. He says, we're on our way. So we got there, and the chieftains were, as ever, gracious and wonderful. And they said, would you care to play our encore with us? And thus began a friendship with them. They played Irish Fest, and we played with them there, and we played the Paps a couple times with them. And that was setting the bar really high. You know, they were amazing. And um, we had met Derek Bell the first time. And uh, he said his hellos to us, you know, at the end, we're all hanging out and having fun. And he went in his dressing room, and of course he had a score spread out and some whiskey set aside. And he was writing stuff forever, but he was going to premiere, I guess, um, a harp piece. And he wanted to premiere it in Milwaukee with Angus as the featured soloist, but we lost him before it could happen. So just an amazing brush with greatness and uh, wonderful people. So. Oh, I want to say early 90s, probably 91, 92. I have pictures, and I have stuff written on the back, and I forget. I don't hang on to dates. <laughs> it's terrible. I'm bad that way. I'm a but historian. Yeah. I know the feeling. So. <laughs> yeah. So that was fun. Nice. So, um, so when you were when you were with the Glen Gillies, and also with um, Frogwater, uh, we'll get to that a little bit. Um, where did you normally play? Did you have like a, a home venue or just a handful that you would go to? And what were they like? Uh, I think the big one for us was Nash's Irish Castle. Um, that was home base. And we, you know, we handmade our posters, you know, hand drew them up, went to some copy shop, had them copied, you know, and charged a nominal cover. And I don't think the bars really liked us back then because a lot of people drank water or soda. So it didn't really make a lot for the bars. That changed over the years. Um, people would come for the fish fries and they'd order pints and, you know, change. But Kit and Josie Nash were, they were like the mom and pop joint of the Irish community. Everybody was welcome there. It was just fabulous. And uh, they would have session nights, they would have dance nights, they would have, you know, Set and Kaylee, and you could show up for sessions. And, um, I mean, I would go there once in a blue moon, not too often. Um, various members of the band would go there with regularity. Um, but it was always a hub of learning, of fun, and sharing, and merriment. So a very welcoming atmosphere. It was great. Do you remember when those sessions began? I don't. They existed before I was on the scene. Um, and there was, you know, always stuff going on there. Um, trying to think. Later on, there was the Black Shamrock on Murray, and the Gillies played there 
We had shortened our name to the Gillies by then. And we played there for two years solid every Thursday. And that was, times were crazier then, and drinking was much more established. Um, but it was fun. We'd have guests come up, and it was a great time. What were some of the other bands that you kind of rubbed shoulders with, either at Nash's or at the Black Shamrock? Well, Who were some um, of your guests? <laughs> I think 180 and the letter G was underway. Um, was Bridget's Fire? No, I can't remember. Uh, later on, no, K, I don't think K was started yet. They weren't, um, I'm trying to think, I'm trying to think. Darn it all, because we'd, we'd go out and see people once in a while. I mean, I can remember the musicians more than I can remember the band. You know, John Sosinski was around, Brett Lipschitz. Um, Danny Beinborn, uh, gosh, I mean, just, and, and who we played with, you know, would come and go. We'd support each other and stuff. Uh, Maria was around. Um, Ed, oh gosh, Ed Paluchek, oh, amazing. I'm just terrible at holding on to stuff. So I suppose it's good that you put it down, what, what I've got left remaining, you know. <laughs> so, yeah. Nice. So any... Any particular any particular stories about shows that you played there that really jumped to mind? Well, I remember one a show at Nash's when um, my my family came out and the place was packed. It was hopping. And my parents brought my little brothers. My brothers are much younger than I am. My mother had remarried, so I have my stepfather who adopted me into the mix. So I have brothers who are 13 and 15 years younger than me, and we've always been really close. And they'd come out to the pub to see us, and uh, my dad, you know, bumped into our friend Joe Bradish, and they went to Marquette High School together, so it was kind of a, oh, it was kind of this family reunion, really fun. And into the mix comes this bunch of lads who were looking to start trouble, uh, to brawl, and, you know, and they started being rather loud and uh, rambunctious and kind of s yelling racist epithets. And my dad, always being a peacemaker, kind of went down. And the one guy was wearing a shirt that said, KKK wants you. And you could just tell everybody was just kind of bristling, prickly. And, you know, Josie was kind of, you know, hand wringing, you know, it was weird. And my dad went over to this one guy and Talk, kind of talked him down, and he was kind of he was like, "Buddy, we got kids here. You know, we're just here having a good time with our families and friends." You know, and he was able, in my dad's amazing way, to talk him out of this, you know, brawling mode. And they had discovered they had a commonality in their family lineage. So there was, you know, some Irish in there, and they had a common name, a last name. And so my dad, within no time, was like you know, back slapping and, and uh, a short time later, this gang of guys left the pub. They kind of tumbled back out into the cold and the whole place erupted in, you know, clapping and laughing and, and, and there was this palpable exhalation of, oh my God, <laughs> you know. But I was always proud of my dad for what he did. And what's, cool. his, what's his name? Richard Dermody. And that was part of my, my maiden name. I had a hyphenated last name. So I was Jeske from my biological dad and Dermody from my adoptive father. So cumbersome uh, maiden name, which I've <laughs> dropped in favor of Nicholson because I didn't want double hyphen. So, <laughs> yeah, but it's okay. Too many syllables. Yeah. <laughs> um, so this kind of actually does playbacks, which we were talking about before, but um, what was the Irish music scene like? Has it changed over the years? And how, if it has? Boy, I think the Irish music scene has it's seen its share of ebbing and flowing. I think in the late 90s, early 2000s, there was this huge wave. I mean, when the Chieftains came to Irish Fest, oh my gosh, it was humongous, you know. Um, and I kind of, when I kind of joined in and was learning, it was it was growing. 
in popularity. And I mean, we saw the likes of, you know, River Dance, Lord of the Dance, all that stuff was, you know, huge and, and very theatrical. But I don't think the love of Irish music and culture has faded. Uh, those people who are aware of what goes on, you know, and have been to Ireland, ideally, um, are still very fervent and passionate about what's out there. And I do still think that it draws people in, like I said before, people who aren't, you know, but a, a hair's breadth of Irish are still drawn to it. I don't think it's as, as monstrous as it was during that period, but I think everything does see, you know, waves in popularity. Um, I still think it's healthy. And I think what is done here at the Celtic Milwaukee Center can, continues to uphold the love and, you know, uh, Irish culture, you know, and Celtic culture. So I think that's great. Nice. So, you know, a lot of the stories we've been sharing have been when you were with the Glen Gillies, later just the Gillies. So how did Frogwater come about? Well, <clears throat> the Gillies had uh, been able to have a, an audience that was of, you know, multiple gener generations. We had young kids, we had old folks, we had everybody in between. We had punk rockers, we had solid uh, Irish enthusiasts. We had a real wide range cast of characters. Because we, did, we didn't play just Irish, we played anything that appealed to us. <laughs> Bluegrass genre, blues, old timey, stuff like that. Um, and then Jan with her Middle Eastern kind of stuff would kind of throw that into the mix. Um, but the Gillies kind of ran their course. I wish we could have continued longer. Jan and Timothy weren't getting along. You know, when you have a married couple in your midst, just ask Fleetwood Mac. Sometimes it doesn't work out. We tried to, you know, bridge that gap and maintain, but it was difficult. And, uh, I kind of was a little tired in my own, wherever I was. John, now he calls himself Jack, that's fine. Half the world knows him as John, half the world knows him as Jack. He's fine, it's both. He can't stop playing. He loves music, he's passionate about music. I mean, when he goes to relax, he plays music. He's like, hey, let's keep this going. And I'm like, okay, I was ready to throw in the towel, sincerely. And so we started playing a few gigs together. And then he suggested we play with our friend Little Rev. And I was friends with Tom Schwark playing mandolin, and we were in, you know, doing stuff with that, and Reedy Buzzards and the Western Box Turtles. Um, so we played as a foursome on and off. But we always had me and John, whether Rev was there or Tom was there. And we started playing at the Dubliner on 2nd Street. And that was an amazing scene. Um, I think Free Whiskey was around, um, Barry Dodd was around, um, and the Gillies played there a little bit, but we had our final show, I think it was December 7th, 1997, at Nash's. I think it was fitting to kind of end where we began. And then John and I started playing with Frogwater, and then the rest, it kind of tumbled from there. Now we're a two-piece, but we play with others. I mean. When Craig Scotland's in town from Texas, he's the third member, sincerely. Uh, if he lived closer, we would have him all the time. Uh, but we play with all kinds of people. We play with Sheila Larkin when we can. We've recorded with her. Our friend John Ritchie, who lives in Michigan, when he comes back, he'll play with us and record with us. So it's a changing cast of characters, but uh, always me and John, for sure. How'd the name come about? Oh, it's so boring. <laughs> really boring, but I'll keep it really short. Um, I worked for a short time at a place called the Puzzle Box in the Grand Avenue. It was a toy store that appealed to both the young and old. And uh, so that Christmas was great for my little brothers. We had all kinds of great toys, but I bought myself something. I bought myself this little box that was called Grow a Frog. And you would send away your postcard and they'd send you a tadpole. And they said, please, whatever you do, if you live in a colder part of the country, don't do this in the winter because you're likely to have your tadpole frozen in the mailbox when you return. And so I got my, my, my tadpole and put him in this little box. 
but it seemed cruel and inhumane, so I had to get him a tank. Bigger, And it became apparent to me that this was not a North American frog. It was an African clawed frog, and they're actually illegal in parts of the South, because if you let them go, they proliferate and knock out the native species. Um, so then you have to get it a filter, because their water gets stinky. But you can't put in tap water, because it has fluoride and chlorine. So I get to go to the pet store, and buy this chemical that takes out the junk. So I had made these jugs and labeled it frog water so nobody would dump it out in my flat. It sat there. So Jack, John, came over one day. We were going to practice the frog water before we were frog water. I said, oh, can I go see your frogs? Because I had to get another frog to keep my first frog company. And he's like, oh, look, man, it's frog water with his oaky California accent because you know how John talks. And I was like, that's hilarious, man, frog water. I love that. We should call ourselves frog water. So I suggested that to the band. And they said, that's lame. <laughs> <laughs> that's a really dumb name. And I said, fine, you come up with a better name, you know. But they didn't. And it stuck. And here we are. That's that. So there was another frog water band in Florida. And they sent us a cease and desist email. But I looked back, and we had been around longer than them. So I said, I think you need to do that. <laughs> so, oh well, it's okay. And what happened to them? <laughs> I don't think they're around anymore. But we actually, their website was really awesome. They were kind of this, this stoner band from Florida. They were this rock band. And their, their website was like the hookah smoking caterpillar from, you know, uh, Alice in Wonderland and stuff like that, and real psychedelic. I was like, oh gosh, can you imagine if somebody looks up their website? And gets our, you know, gets them mixed up with us. They might. I don't know if they want. I don't know if we want frog water for our wedding, <laughs> or, or or whatever, you know. But so, and this is something you've kind of touched on, or well, yeah, this is something you've touched on already a little bit. But um, who are some of the other other people that you've collaborated with over the years? Oh my gosh, it's so many. Um. Every once in a while, I get asked to play on recordings for local musicians. And it doesn't matter if it was you know, rock or blues or that. I mean, um, I recorded with uh, Melanie Jane on cello when she started playing cello again for Victor De Lorenzo from the Violet Femmes. And he and Connie Grower were in a project called Pancake Day. And this was after the Femmes, so it was really fun working with them. So we did a piece for them. Um, I worked with Alex Ballard and Sugarfoot. I played in a band with Martin Jack Rosenblum, AKA the Holy Ranger. So we were kind of a Harley Davidson biker band for a number of years. Um, I played with the Wooldridge Brothers, whom I always loved. Um, they were wonderful. Uh, who else? Um, I play now with a band called Panelore. Not very often, I wish it was more often. Um, but it's more uh, alt Americana rock original stuff. Mm. Um, probably think of more later, but there have been a, a diverse uh, cast of people. We just actually, John and I just recorded with uh, Tom and Barb Weber, Fair, Fair Weber, kind of more folk original stuff, singer songwriter stuff. Um, our friend Jason Moon, who is wonderful, we continue to collaborate with him on his recordings. Um, he's a veteran of the Iraq War, and he has taken his struggles with PTSD out on the road to help other veterans. Um, and he founded a nonprofit called Warrior Songs that uses music and writing, poetry, music, combining them to help veterans heal and work with their struggles. And we really, really support that. We're on board with that 100%. So. I don't know. The future is, is bright, and uh, different interesting opportunities continue to present themselves. So. Nice. Now, obviously, what, um, obviously you said when you were at the Gillies, you played mainly Irish music, did other styles as well. Um, what other um, genres or just influences have you had besides just standard Irish music? Well, as a kid, I really enjoyed playing by ear. Um, if you could, you know, 
suss out, find, you know, certain instrumental parts in, or just the melody, just the vocal line of the piece. Like I love picking apart, you know, Beatles songs or you know, playing along with them. And uh, that was always fun. I was never one to practice and I'm still not. I don't like playing when other people are around. But it's really fun playing along to recordings and try to find out other harmony parts, you know, having listened to uh, grown up with the Beatles and the Everly Brothers, stuff like that. Harmonies kind of present themselves in fun ways. I wish I had a more, I don't know, I wish I, I thought more than thirds and fifths and stuff like that, but I think that's kind of the traditional way of stacking it, you know. But uh, working with the kids nowadays, that's another opportunity because uh, they're really into that. They can play ukulele and stuff like that. We started a ukulele club at the school where our kids go. Um, I don't know. I, I welcome all kinds of other things. Jan would bring to the front um, Macedonian, uh, Georgian, as in from uh, Russia, Georgia, um, Serbian stuff, because her father was involved in folk fair, and all these really wonderful time signatures. It's still really lost on me. I kind of am a theory phobe. I, I'm, I'm kind of, I run from it. I, I, tend to play more for about like feeling and then I'll try to fit in that way but uh, when it comes to theory I kind of run away you know but yeah all kinds of styles yeah I don't know if that answers it yeah no it does so you mentioned playing with kids so um, can you explain a little bit about what about what that is well recently in December at our daughter's behest we started a ukulele club in their middle school. Which is, so this is fourth through eighth graders. And we have anywhere from 12 to 16 kids every Tuesday um, when we can. So this is kind of our, our community involvement. And we're playing, you know, the old chestnuts, like You Are My Sunshine, you know, Jambalaya, stuff like that, two and three chord numbers, just to get their fingers used to it. And they, of course, complain most vociferously, that, oh, my hands hurt, it hurts, you know. Um, I've worked with young kids, both with private lessons, and then, uh, oh goodness, a handful of years ago, probably the early 2000s, Marsha Gora Paddock, she was teaching at uh, Homestead High School, and she had an event called Strings in Spring, and she brought in Jerry Lockney and Randy Sabine and me, there might have been, uh, I think Kathy Pike was involved there, and we were teaching the kids varying techniques, fiddle, you know, jazz, Irish, bluegrass, stuff like that. So I was working with four and five-year-olds and up through into high school. And the four and five-year-olds were really fun and then the middle school kids were really fun and they were really little sponges. And then you start to get to high school kids where they're, they're smart and they're accomplished and they know everything, you know. So then you're like, okay, what am I going to do? So in that instance, that's where I, I don't know what I'm going to do with these kids. So I brought up cross-tuning. And because I remember when I first tiptoed into that, uh, kind of blew my little classically trained mind. Like, it's just D, A, D, G. That's all there is, standard. So that, that got their attention. That was kind of fun. But a handful of these kids are still playing. One of my friends that I met, met there, Ben Kroger, uh, he's still playing. He's a jazz whiz. And he's like in his 20s. It just blows my mind. So some of these kids keep going. And whether or not it's for pleasure, for your own happiness, or if you're doing this as a livelihood, I don't think you can go wrong, you know, playing what you love, if it's Irish or whatever. And that's what, you know, my mom said, I wanted you to have music in your life something to fall back on for enjoyment. I never thought you'd be playing the bars <laughs> for a living. So there we are. So when you, you, you were saying we quite a bit, is, does your husband play as well? Indeed. What does he play? Everything with strings. Um, primarily guitar and banjo. Um, but he taught himself fiddle. And people are always asking me, oh, you taught, you taught him? I have nothing to do with it. This is his own creation and uh, he's quite good. Um, he'll play ukulele, he's 
written some books of instruction on that. And I mean, he's wonderful. He's, he's my, my comfort zone. He's my rock. And uh, it's a lot of fun to play with. So, uh, yeah. What's his name? Uh, John Jack Nicholson. Oh, yes. <laughs> We went, we met through music, definitely, um, and we have varying stories. He claims that our mutual friend, um, Sean McNally, introduced us, which I tend to think is correct. I mean, we were out seeing a friend's band on on the east side. We had you know, so many bands to go see, you know, and kind of the punk, and you know, alt Americana, you know, really fun stuff, you know, Joker's Henchmen and. Uh, Loyal Order of Water Buffalo, and you know all these great Milwaukee bands we'd go out and see, and uh, I do remember them there. And then we we met another time. We went out to see Michelle Shock at uh, Shank Hall, and she was always so much fun to go see. And she had audience members, you know, dancing, just having a blast. And she wanted us all to do the worm, and nobody would do the worm with me, but John did the worm with me. So I was like, oh, friend, <laughs> you know. <laughs> So uh, he was just fun, you know. And when he came back to town, he'd been living in California. He came back to town, and I just was totally smitten with him as a person. He was just so full of appreciation of music and life in general. He was really fun to hang out with. I said, you know, after a few pints, I said, you should come to my band's practice, the Glen Gillies. you got to meet my bandmates. You should, you should come hang out with us and play with us. And I just invited him not knowing what he played. And he came and he played and the band was like, do you want to join our band? <laughs> so it was like instant, you know. Um, so, you know, love through music is, is really wonderful. Be it, you know, a partnership, you know, as like a coworker or a life partner. Um, it's really a wonderful foundation for us. You know, it's been great. So now obviously, <clears throat> excuse me, obviously your primary instrument is the fiddle. Do you play anything else? Um, I play mandolin because it's tuned the same. I played with the Milwaukee Mandolin Orchestra for a number of years. That was another one. Um, I play viola because it's very similar, but my reading on viola is remedial at best. I can do it if I have to, um, but I just, I love viola, you know, low instrument. I've tiptoed into ukulele territory because I'm part of this club now <laughs> and tipple which is another jack instrument so that's that's akin to the ukulele um, I play guitar if I have to but I kind of stink at it uh, but I do that um, I just we just finished a recording with um, new vintage new vintage frets which is a Milwaukee based mandolin ensemble we play all Vega instruments uh, and we're focusing uh, for the recording that we did on tunes and songs that have connections to Milwaukee and Wisconsin. So that was another recent project. So, yeah. Yes. Now, uh, what's your association, if any, with Irish Fest? I love Irish Fest. <laughs> um, it's like Christmas in August. Um, it's really fun. I... Since the Glen Gillies, we'd always played Irish Fest, always. Be it at the harp tent with Angus, featuring that instrument, or at the Snug or the Village Pub, or playing Keeley dances. We were always involved. When, I think somewhere in the beginning of Frogwater, after the Gillies breakup, I think we missed one year. But we had played, I have played Irish Fest every year since I believe 1989. So it's a pretty long run. And uh, certainly for Jack, my other half, for him, it's, it's really Christmas in August. I mean, that's the be all end all. I mean, he changes his strings, he changes his batteries, he, you know, and no matter, <laughs> no matter what we do, it's just like the weather around Irish Fest. You get what you get, and you don't get upset. You know, you're there with fa the big family. Um, and it's truly like a family reunion. You see people that you don't see all year or you haven't seen in a few years. 
Um, and inevitably, something will happen. There will be a heat wave. There will be a ty typhoon. There will be floods. You'll break strings. Your pickup will go haywire. There might be feedback when you're doing an acapella number, as we did with the Glen Gillies. Oh my gosh. But you keep going. And it's just all about, it, you got to punt. And you got to have fun. It's, it's the best. It's great. We're so, I have to say, we're so blessed to have a festival of its caliber in our town. So it's cool. What's one of your favorite Irish Fest stories? Or more than oh, one? Boy. I mean, the Chieftains, the Chieftains were, that was the year of the floods. It was horrifying. It was so crowded that year. And that's when we still wore our costume, you know, our, our plaid. And a lot of it was dry clean only, with wool and this and that. And I mean, how many plaid slash dress top ensembles did you have at that time? I mean, we lived a lot more simply. It was a little desperate at times, but... That was, that was memorable. And just the, the chaos of people wanting to come backstage. Chicago families, Milwaukee families, and the, the stage crew being beside themselves with, we have the chieftains, we, have, we can't have everybody back here. It was, it was mayhem. It was crazy, but it was fun. It was really fun. I think one of my, one of my biggest memories of Irish Fest ever was we had finished, Frogwater had finished a show at the Snug. I think it was a Saturday night, the late slot, and it was crazy. You know, it was pretty fun and spirits were high. And we finished the show and I went outside just to get a breather. And there's this little old man who wanted to strike up a conversation with me. And he was from Scotland. I, you know, and he was from Glasgow. His name was Danny Friel. And we struck up this instant friendship. I gave him our CD. I just adored him from the second I got to talking to him. And we continued our conversation. You know, he wrote me letters. I wrote to him. He'd call me from Glasgow. He'd send me little packages. Just darling. His daughter lives here in Milwaukee. She still does. Uh, Rosemary Leggett and her family. And uh, through the years, I became friends with his wife. We actually traveled there. We met Rose. Rose was afraid of traveling on planes, so we had to go to her. We had to go to the mountain. Mm -hmm. And uh, I lost Danny. We lost Danny, but I just, you know, he was a treasure to us, to all of us. And um, he, when he called from Glasgow, it's so hard to understand the Glaswegian <laughs> accent. <laughs> And I was like, oh my gosh, how did I understand him from the beginning, you know? And my mom asked me, she said, well, when you first met him, had you had a pint? And I said, well, yeah. She said, that's why you understood him. <laughs> but uh, he was darling, and I'll always treasure that. That was the coolest. Nice. Hold on a second. I guess... Um, moving outside of Irish Fest and stuff, with another question about a story. Um, is there, do you have any, is there any story about just playing in the bar scenes and everything else, which obviously your mother didn't expect you to do, um, just really jump out at you, just something that you still like to tell even years later? Oh my gosh. There are so many. I mean, for me, I mean, it, it's really hard to pinpoint certain things because I'm a I'm a door watcher I'm a people watcher and I will occasionally tell our audiences we realize we're on stage but you can't forget we're watching you you know you're you're my entertainment you know and I love you know the little things that happen and occasionally we'd get you know somebody you'd least expect some some dude you know who'd hop up and just start doing the Irish dance and you'd be like you know, the whole place was just, whoa, you know, so cool. Um, fights would break out, as does when tempers flare and alcohol is involved. Um, playing with the Glen Gillies as a small ensemble at High Wind Books on Oakland Avenue. When my brothers were little, and Timothy got up in his full 
you know, killed his Scottish regalia and danced a fling. And my brothers were really little at the time, and they, Tim always, Tim always loved this story. So did Jan, and he's he's not a small fellow. He's tall and kind of broad, you know. He's dancing this fling, and my brothers are watching the floorboards bounce, and they're kind of like, whoa, looking up at him in his kilt. You know, <laughs> that was that was fun. I don't know, seeing seeing the gathering of generations, especially in pubs, because pubs are public houses. And you know, all are welcome. So seeing people of many backgrounds, any races, any beliefs, old people, little people, I always say I have to watch my jokes. They can be a little bit body because you know, you might be old, so you're kind of censoring certain things because somebody's grandma might be there. You might be old, but you're not dead. <laughs> it's the same thing like when we go out, we play in our community, we play at the nursing homes and the senior homes. These people are still there, and they've lived lives and have experienced so many more things than I have. They're not dead. They're still there, you know? So you have to pull at these things. Can you share a joke with us? Oh, God. <laughs> On camera? Are you serious? Oh, God. Um, I, I think one of my fav favorites, and it, the the problem for me is I collect jokes because when we change instruments, there's downtime. And people don't want silence. They don't want radio silence. They want you interacting. So I started collecting jokes and stories just to have a little stall time. People will send me jokes all the time, stories all the time. And darn it all, if I haven't, I haven't heard them all. I've gotten them all. Every once in a while, one will crop in. Um, One of my favorites, everybody's probably heard it, but Brenda O'Malley is home one night making dinner, waiting for her husband to come home from work. And there comes a knock at the door. And she opens the door, and it's her husband, Patty's co-worker, Tim. She says, oh, Tim, what brings you to our house tonight? Where's Patty? He says, I'm here because there was a terrible accident at the Guinness plant today. May I come in? Of course, says she. Oh, dear Lord. He says, Brenda, dear. I'm afraid Patty's, Patty's life is in it. She says, oh, sweet Jesus, this is terrible news. She says, tell me, Tim, did he suffer? Please tell me he didn't suffer. And Tim says, well, he fell into the vat, and he got out three times to pee, and then he finally went down. <laughs> It's a good joke, you know. <laughs> anyway, and I don't, I don't do an accent very well, but I'll, I'll keep working on it. Yeah. <laughs> it was pretty good. So, probably better than mine. So, <laughs> um, I'm all ears. <laughs> not right now. <laughs> um, so yeah. So where do you, you know, we um, we touched on some of this, but um, where do you see the scene developing in the years to come? I am continually impressed. Um, not that I am one to be impressed. You know, I, I, I'm, I'm always amazed at what is being done here at the, the Celtic Milwaukee Society. And I, I'm never quite sure what to call it at this point. But with the archives, um, we had played a, a gig once for the archives and brought people from all over the country, all over the world, who are archivalists here. This is stunning. This is amazing. This draws people from all over. The uh, Irish Fest Summer School is incredible. I am racking my brains, brain, I only have one, why we don't have more people here. This is a wealth of uh, knowledge and experience, people who come here. Um, I don't know, I, I see Milwaukee as a real hotbed of things Irish, things Celtic. And uh, I would hope that somehow some little, you know, wave gets out there that draws more people to this because we have so much to offer. Milwaukee does in general. I mean, I think for a city of our, our size, we have such a vibrant arts community. Um, our theater, our uh, ballet, our symphony, 
And I think the Irish community, our, our ethnic community, feeds into that. Um, I think we're really blessed to have what we have here. And I think if we just continue like this, I mean, we're, we're not really out to get rich, I guess. I mean, I'd take it if it happened. Um, but rich and famous, I mean, that should happen here. I don't see why it wouldn't. I think we have all the makings of, of something wonderful. Thanks. So if you, if you had an opportunity to do one thing within the Irish scene, either personally or for the scene itself, itself that hasn't been done, what would it be? That it hasn't been done in general or I haven't done? Both. Well, because uh, Jack and I work a lot with United Performing Arts Fund in Milwaukee, raising money and awareness for the arts. We work with Renaissance Theater Works, which we have a long, long ties with. I would like to see more Irish theater. Uh, we have done that. And I think it's really cool when they do. And actually, there's been a little spike in that recently. Uh, Next Act has put up a few things. And I, I should be thinking more of what's been happening recently. Um, Milwaukee Chamber Theater did one. They did Chapati not too long ago. Um, there's a lot that could be done in that regard. Um, I wish more original work could be done. Um, Jack and I are writing tunes. We probably should be doing more, but whenever we can. Um, we're contemporary Irish Americans. And while we strive to keep the old tunes going, you know, Phil Rebenzer's book and all these great collections of tunes, the archives, um, that's a wealth right there. But there's no reason why we and other local musicians can't be writing new tunes that have ties to Milwaukee in the Irish style or in the Scottish style. And actually, on that note, Jack and I have been working with our dear friend Jennifer Rupp. Um, she's been writing a series of Scottish, historically based romance novels. And I, I almost feel like I'm blushing. Um, people scoff at romance. And since tiptoeing into this genre, I don't think people should. What's wrong with the feeling of a little amore in our lives? Um, and Jennifer is a, an amazing writer. She asked us to underscore her books, if you will, um, and write tunes for the characters and the settings. And so she commissioned us to write music for her website, which we're in the process of. And she said, by the time I'm done with a series of books and you are done with the tunes that go along with the stories, you should have an album. So, dot, dot, dot. Yeah. That is pretty cool. I think there's a lot that could be done in our community. Okay. So, I guess, you know, that's about all the questions I have, but I've been told that you wanted to play a little bit for us, possibly. I could. I could. Yeah. One, one, one follow-up. Yes. Uh, I, um, so, I know you play for Kaylee's, but you play for Sex as well. Mm -hmm. Can you describe a little bit of your uh. Oh my gosh, I remember that well. <laughs> that was with the Glen Gillies, and um, we would play predominantly Kaylee's. Uh, there was a VFW post, the George Washington Post in Bayview, which they mm -hmm. tore down, which breaks my heart. This was recently. They're making way for more multi story condos in Bayview. Um, we would play Kaylee's, and I'll never forget. Just the process of jumping from, I mean, didn't want to play one tune for the whole thing. It gets, for us, it gets boring. And I think dancers notice the shift in gears, and you're like, yeah, you know? So we would do sets. And I just remember my brain going, okay, what's the first two bars? So we would copy and paste, you know? And I just remember dances felt. It was so hard, man. Playing for 10 minutes, 12 minutes, 15 minutes, playing continuously. Now it's like, you know, you know how it is, and it's it's great. But honestly, that was huge to do that. That really uh, lays your foundation 
Um, that's a blast. I mean, now I, I get it. And I, I should dance more. I hardly ever dance. But the little light bulb, what you put out there to the dance floor comes back to you tenfold. It's this big, amazing circle of energy. And if you're playing cool, edgy tunes, the dancers feel it and they fly, you know? We've done sets. Sets are much more regimented. And set dancers know what they want when they want it. They want their, their tempos the way they want it. And I'm completely fine with that. Um, it's a little more arduous because they're ready to go. They don't need to be taught. So you're working, you know, you're earning your muscle for those. It's cool. And watching them, it's, it's an art form. I really love Kaylee's just because of the craziness, the zaniness, the fact that there is this person who just learned that dance, but they're bringing them into the fold. They don't care. This is social dancing. This is welcoming. And we have, oh my gosh, Gail, uh, she's doing this for the love of the art. You know, I absolutely adore, you know, Gail and Julie and all these callers, Patricia, you know, our friend. So, yeah, big time. Yep. I hope that answers you. Yeah. Okay. Uh, well, Pike Creek Bluegrass Band was a group of guys who were friends from high school on Kenosha. And they started this bluegrass thing, and it, it wasn't purest bluegrass, but it was just kind of good time, fun stuff, bluegrass-ish tunes, you know. And um, they had a string of musicians through the years. Um, and then there was, you know, a number of fiddlers. So I came on the tails of Jerry Lockman. He was <laughs> leaving mighty big footprints to fill. Um, but it was just fun. I and mean, we played pretty much a few times a month in Cedarburg at uh, Morton's, Wisconsin. It was just a good time bar, you know, eatery. And uh, we'd play occasionally parties and weddings and stuff like that, just fun times. But man, that, that really builds your, your stamina, your stuff. That's why I first started getting trigger finger, you know, and then it went away and then I got it back. You know, it's, I think it's here to stay, <laughs> but it's just what it is, you know, you use what you have. So I don't know. I mean, there's, I just thought of another one, um, playing with, uh, Martin Jack Rosenblum, the, the Holy Ranger at Spirit Farm, when the, uh, Harley Davidson 90th was happening absolute mayhem in Milwaukee and we played or we were about to play at the Outlaw Clubhouse it's on the south side of Milwaukee but we got rained out outside so we went inside for a while it's kind of interesting we played the Outlaw Alternative in Waukesha so we opened for Tommy Chong <laughs> which was really fun um, yeah I mean there's tons of stories I just you know of course I'm brain dead now on camera but I don't know, thinking back to the pubs too, I mean, when you're on stage and you're really focusing on people, you see people in front of you rekindling friendships, you see people falling in love, you see people falling out of love, <laughs> you see, you know, so many things. And a lot of the guys at the, uh, the Black Shamrock, the O'Keefe brothers, mm. were tending bar there. Um, Jim, yeah. you know, but just fun, fun times. It's like, to seeing them now is like a family reunion, you know, again, but uh, I miss that. I really do. I mean, now we have, we have the County Clare. We have, you know, sessions and stuff, which I never get to go to. One day, yeah. I will. But, uh, you know, House of Guinness out in Waukesha and uh, all kinds of places, you know. O'Donoghue's host stuff. We get out when we can, but, uh, yeah. <laughs> Any genre that you've always wanted to play but just never had a chance to? Oh, wow. Um, I love, probably stemming from when I hung out with Jan, I love gypsy music. I love Transylvania music. She took me to see a band from Transylvania playing uh, at a church on Oklahoma, right across from Humboldt Park years ago and they were stunning 
absolutely stunning. They had a cymbal in the band and their fiddlers, they played kind of a little down lower and they played with this very robust, a lot of push to it. By the end of the evening's concert, the guys' white shirts were soaked and stuck to their skin. They were playing so hard. It was just breathtaking. Um, we'd hang out. We used to hang out at Miro's on the east side, Serbian restaurant, and we'd sometimes dance through the restaurant, and there'd be a long string of people and somebody at the end with a towel. I would love to play that music. I would love to play let's run music. The Jewish people have this. I mean, <laughs> we were playing at the Jewish Home and Care Center on Prospect a week ago. It was a birthday party. And I said to Jack, I said, play Finjenta. It's Norwegian, but it's in a minor key. The Jews love things in minor keys. It's just, it's, it's great. It's just this, this heart-wrenching, you know, missing the homeland kind of stuff. I love that stuff. I mean, it's great. I mean, there's weird stuff that we see, like African music. Um, I don't know. I, I saw that, ja was it Japanese or Chinese with the captive bow where it's like on there? I'd like to try that, you know? There's not enough time in one lifetime, you know? And looking back, I'll never forget being up north with, Jan, Ernest, and Timo, Timothy Schmitz. We were staying on a, at a friend's cottage on an island outside of Rhinelander. So we had to row out and row back. And we went to a pizzeria I used to go to as a kid outside of Monaco called Mama's, Mama's Pizza. And um, we were just drinking wine and having pizza and laughing and talking and crying, and, you know. And I said, you know, I wish I could live many lifetimes and not be responsible for what I do, you know, <laughs> like a Casanova. But um, I kind of sat there and talked for a while longer, and then I realized I, you know, I have, even back then, lived many lifetimes already. And now, you know, I'm a, I'm a mom, I'm married, I never thought, you know, I'd walk in those shoes. I still play music because, well, it's my livelihood. But, and, and you don't, oh gosh, it, you don't want to be in the position of, but we need this gig, we're broke, we gotta make the, you know, make the mortgage. And, and sometimes it is kind of tight. We do it for our living. But anytime I'm feeling, you know, there are times when you question, why do I do what I do? And you're out there playing for people and looking at, you know, the joy that you bring. And... You know, and everybody does it differently. When you're feeling down in the dumps, there's always, no matter what, there's always going to be somebody better than you. Always. Even if you're, you know, king of the heap, there's always going to be somebody who's still coming up and learning and, you know, doesn't know as much as you. Um, so it keeps you human. It keeps you in a good place. I don't know. I think I have the best, I mean, if you want to call it a job, I've got the best job in the world. Thanks so much for coming oh, today. Thank Susan. you. Thank you.